Hey there, friends and running fans. This is Ambie Burfoot welcoming you to the latest episode of the podcast, Running State of the Sport. And this is George Hirsch, your co-host at Running State of the Sport. In every episode, we talk to the smartest, most informed, most influential, and sometimes fastest runners on the planet. This week, I would have to say that we combine both smart and fast with Clayton Young, the BYU graduate who recently finished second in the U.S. Olympic Marathon Trials, just behind his training partner, Connor Mance. It looked to most of us like Clayton could have won that race, and in our interview today, he admits as much. But he also says he was so caught up in the joy and emotion of making an Olympic team that it really didn't matter to him at the time who won. I love that, Amby. Uh, Clayton, you know, had surgery just a year before the trial. So his comeback from that surgery all the way to his 208 flat in Chicago and his spectacular race in the trials is really inspiring. And he's a self-admitted nerd runner who's competed well in the heat So he's liking the idea of a challenging course and probably warm conditions if if the Olympic marathon is coming August in Paris. But before we talk to Clayton, Amby, I'd like to discuss the biggest recent running news. So what caught your attention recently? Well, I have to admit, George, being a running nerd myself, that I was really drawn in by Camille Heron's six-day race in the Lululemon event called Further. Uh, She has had a long, successful career in ultra running, but has never done anything approaching six days, how many people would. And she was out there for that long and in the process sent set so many new records of various distances, I couldn't possibly enumerate them all. But in the end, she got herself a new world record for women for the six-day race. She hit 560 miles. That eclipsed the old record of 549, which was set way back in 1990, which tells you that there aren't a lot of six-day races out there, I think. Just for fun, I got to recite her daily totals, her miles for each of the 24-hour periods. Here we go. First day, 132 miles. Second day, still over 100 at 115. And then 94, 89, 72, and 58 miles. It was a great event uh, and a great performance by Camille Heron. And uh, I think uh, she has so much energy. I'm sure she's going to be running lots more big races like this one. George, I know you were in Barcelona for a race this weekend. What was that? And did you have time to keep up with any other running news? Yeah, both. Ambi. I uh, uh, was thrilled to get back to Barcelona. It, it's become one of my very favorite cities. And the atmosphere around their marathon, of which I was uh, an invited guest and couldn't <laughs> couldn't turn that one down, uh, was just uh, it was high energy. There there was just a warmth, and it was great. Twenty thousand runners. They had a new course this year. It was flat, and it incorporated all the highlights of the city, the Gaudi Church, La Sagrada Familia, that everyone, of course, must see when they go to Barcelona. And, you know, I would have to say that if any runners out there among our listeners are looking to combine a great vacation with a really first-rate marathon, uh, Barcelona is the place to go. Uh, It was plenty quick. 20501 for the men at 219 for the women. So uh, you will just have a great time there. And, you know, Amby, being there as we were in 92 in the Olympics, it's just great to see what the Olympics has done. The infrastructure from the Olympics has been used to transform Barcelona into one of the great capital cities in the world now just a just a great story so uh that was it and while i was there 
uh, two names jumped out at me in the NCAA championships. They've been uh, getting our attention all year long. Parker Valdi of Florida did a double and won the 5,000 and 3,000 in very, very respectable terms. And Nico Young of Northern Arizona, who you and I have been talking about, Andy, is a guy who, you know, right out of college could uh, find himself on the Olympic team and in Paris. He also won the 5K and the 3K on the track. Uh, good times. He ran a 13.25 for 5K, and we know he's already run faster than that. Um so I think uh, I think he'll be in the mix in the U.S. Olympic trials, and I certainly wouldn't bet against him. Uh, he's got that good coach Mike Smith down there at Northern Arizona. I think he could uh, he could end up uh, in Paris in, in uh, this coming summer Olympics. So that's my take on what's gone on recently. George, I'm glad you had such a great trip to Barcelona. Certainly a spectacular city. And uh, thanks for the notes on the NCAA championships as well. I agree. Parker Valby and Nico Young are going to be people we'll be watching all year long. And that's the latest and biggest recent running news as we see it here at Running State of the Sport. This podcast, Running State of the Sport, is brought to you by MarathonHandbook.com and RunLongRunHealthy.com. Marathon Handbook is the world's leading marathon website with a special focus on trustworthy running information and free runner-tested training plans for all ability levels. Run Long, Run Healthy is Ambie's weekly newsletter with the newest, most scientific, and most useful training advice for runners. Now let's turn to Clayton Young, this week's guest on running State of the Sport. Clayton recently finished second to his training partner, Connor Mance, in the U.S. Olympic Marathon Trials. That secured him a spot on the 2024 U.S. Olympic team bound for Paris in August. And it was a spot, I might add, that was really a lot tougher to achieve than in past years, which we'll talk about. But Clayton comes with the strong pedigree of past Olympic marathon runners from Brigham Young University. So we're pretty sure he's ready to go where he wants to go. Clayton, congrats on that great race in Orlando. And thanks for joining us today on the podcast. Thank you so much for the invite. Happy to be on the the podcast and uh, looking forward to our conversation. Well, uh, Clayton, uh, yeah, congrats on uh, that uh, terrific run in the trials. And the first question, and (laughs) this is partly in jest, uh, but only partly, uh, let's say you and Connor Mance, uh, as you did in Orlando, Come down toward the finish at the Esplanade des Invalides at the end of the Paris Olympic Marathon, and you've got a clear gap over the third runner. Who's going to win the gold? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, yeah, if we were in that situation, I, you know, I think we would both just be so elated. It would be hard to uh, to know who would who would take the gold. Um, you know, we've we've gone through this scenario so many times that it's. It's it's kind of at this point where, you know, we, we always tell ourselves after these situations, ah, oh, we should have just raced to the finish line. We should have just gone all out. But, you know, obviously at the trials and on the Olympic stage, I think we couldn't help but enjoy the moment. And, uh, you know, maybe maybe like we saw in the, the high jump a couple of years back, we could cross the line together and both get gold and, and it'd be a win win. Who knows? But, uh, <laughs> you know, Connor and I are both really competitive. So who knows what would happen in the moment? We'll just wait till the moment to really make it. Well, we're going to really we'll, decide. We'll come back to that whole finishing question. Uh, I think it deserves a little more time. But first, uh, let, let's talk about you, get a little more background on you, your age, where you're living now. And so our listeners can get a whole sense of you, your family, your situation. And, uh, you know, what do you do uh, in your in your non-running hours as well? 
Yeah, great question. Uh, I just turned 30, the dreaded 30. I think uh, because of my time at BYU, my age has been uh, thrown all over the internet and I'm and I'm kind of tired of it. So the fact that I turned 30 was kind of a downer. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm 30. I, I, I'm married to my beautiful wife, Ashley, and we have two girls. They're five and three, Lucy and Jenna, and uh, they really keep us grounded um, in, in all things in this world, uh, keep us happy and sad and anxious. And, um, they've been fantastic, uh, to just, to just really live life with. Um, but yeah, we're living just South of Provo in Springville, Utah. I I got a 10 minute drive to BYU right now where I often train. And, uh, we've been here for a couple of years now and, uh, I'm sandwiched between Connor Mance who lives in Provo and, and Jared Ward, my other training partner who lives down in Mapleton, just 10 minutes South. So, um, yeah, what keeps me busy besides running? I do a little bit of contract work for Stryker. They're a medical device company, and I work in their sports medicine division, just doing some early early stages prototyping for them and and research and development. And that is sometimes what uh, takes up my time when when I'm sick of running. I, I love to engineer, and when I'm sick of engineering, I love to running. But uh, that's just a little bit of nutshell of of what what's going on in my life right now. Well, how much? Tell us about the running part of your life. How much running are you doing? Maybe you're just getting back to it now after the trials, but when you're going full bore, how many hours, how many miles does that take? Yeah, great question. I think every year it's been a, an, a more and more commitment to, to the, the sport of, of running and, and how much of a, an art it is. You know, this build into the trials, I was running between 100 and 120, 25 miles a week. And, uh, and that was also having two lift sessions a week. Um, sauna sessions five to six times a week and then sports psychology thrown in there as well um and and then uh yeah don't don't count out the nap as well that i'm trying to get in a couple hours every day and and then get the eight to ten hours of sleep so it's been a busy schedule i think there were days where i would leave um to byu and it would take me six or seven hours to get through the routine that we we, we've set up there at byu and and um and so yeah that's that's what it's like typically right now. It's obviously been a little bit more chill. You know, I took two weeks, pretty low mileage and just enjoying running for running's sake. Uh, if I felt like running, I'd go for run. If I didn't, I didn't. And, uh, but now I'm kind of back into training. I'm actually running the New York city half marathon, March 17th. Um, and you know, that's a little close. Um, but we couldn't pass up the opportunity to go out there and kind of get some international experience to run on some Hills and to really, uh, be part of the great event that the New York road runners put on. And so we're going to be out there and it'll be early in our training. Like I've done a couple workouts and I'm back up to maybe 70 to 80 miles right now, but it'll all just kind of build as we, we go into the, to the Olympics in Paris. You'll, you'll enjoy the New York half and I'm sorry, I, I won't be there. Uh, uh, usually of course I am, but this uh, yeah. year I'm a guest of the Barcelona marathon on the same day. Ooh. Yeah, exactly. That's not one you, you turn down lightly. So, Seriously. <laughs> but have a have a good time in New York for sure. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, why don't we go back a little and tell us how you started running and what got you into it, and you know what did you like about it back then? And yeah, great question. I uh, I think my origin story starts in fifth grade. I my my elementary school had an, an interesting program called mileage club and essentially every every friday during lunch recess i could run you know the school was asked to run laps around not asked we we had the option of running laps around the soccer field and every lap that you'd run you'd get a ticket and these tickets you would add up um you'd just keep them in your hand and then at the end of recess you'd go turn them into your teacher and it was an individual competition as well as a classroom competition. And my my best friend and my com- number one competitor, he was in the opposing class. And so him and I would run out there during Friday lunch recess and run as many laps as we could. And, and you know, we ended up running close to 100 miles that year um, just during Friday lunch recesses. And that's when I found out I was really good. And um, that's kind of where it started. Uh, but then, you know, fifth, sixth grade, obviously, I... I loved all sports and I played basketball and baseball and I played soccer as well. And then I found out obviously I was good at running and I ultimately had to make the choice of, you know, same season sports. And obviously I was really good at track and, and cross country. And so that's where things started to shift. And, um, I, I committed to it full time, but 
Um, but yeah, then the rest is kind of history. I, I moved to Utah and, and went to the to American Fork High School before it was on the map, and now it's on the map. And and then from there to BYU. So uh, that's that's the origin story. Clayton, you've obviously been very talented at running for a long time. But I also feel like it's almost honest to ask you, where have you been hiding the last three or four years? I mean, people have heard of Jared Ward and Connor Mance and maybe even Ed Eyestone, the old timers like George <laughs> and me. But you sort of burst onto the consciousness uh, a little bit late. So what was going on? Yeah, great question. I think, you know, several people have asked me, you know, where were you as a runner and where was this personality? And and I just have told them, you know, I've been here the whole time. It's just I'm finally getting the the media attention that that uh, that people want, I guess. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's been here. Uh, you know, I've had a lot of ups and downs throughout my career. And as my my professional career hasn't been pretty, that's for sure. Um, so, you know, I think coach Eyestone, he, he definitely breeds us as marathon runners in our college days. I think it's, it's, you know, we have less fear of the distance than most collegiate athletes because it's just, you know, with him being a two-time Olympian in the marathon and then also training with Jared Ward when I was in my college days as he would come train with us as a pro, I think it just was the natural next step. It just took me, took me some time to figure out the distance and to really learn it, uh, to its potential. But, um, it's been here this whole time. Well, I've certainly noticed looking at your marathon career that your first one was a big time 229 in the <laughs> 2020 trials in Atlanta. And the next year in Chicago in 2021, it sounded like you were going pretty good. But then what happened? <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's a great story in and of itself. But yeah, in, in, in 2020, I, I decided to still toe the line of the the Olympic trials simply just for experience sake. I'd, I just gone pro in 2019 and, and, um, you know, I hadn't run a marathon. I qualified with a half marathon, but I had gotten injured as most people do in, in my build to the trials. And, you know, I got healthy with three weeks to spare and I'd been running three weeks when I decided to run the trials and, and, you know, it wasn't pretty by any means, but I decided just to run the distance just cause I knew that experience would pay off in four years. And, and now I can say it did. Um, but yeah, as for that first Chicago marathon, that was when I was like, okay, you know, I actually had a solid build. It wasn't perfect, but it was good. And I, I felt like I could, you know, compete well, but it ended up being a, a kind of a hot and humid Chicago, uh, it was a rare hot and humid Chicago. And so, um, you know, gun goes off and, and I get through halfway and I'm feeling good and I'm covering moves and I'm in this pack of, uh, lead American men and, and it's all going to plan. And in fact, I, I think I'm in like seventh place with about a mile to go. And, you know, obviously my muscles start cramping and I start hitting the wall. And then with 300 meters to go, less than a lap around the track is, is when my body starts folding in half. My hamstrings are just, and lower back are just cramping so bad. I can't s stand up straight. And I'm just trying to put one foot in, in front of the other. And I hit the deck, you know, facing the asphalt. And the medics are so concerned that they rush me, in fact, and, uh, I, I say, Hey, don't touch me. I want to finish this race. I don't want to be disqualified. Don't touch me. And so they, they back off and I eventually get to my feet and I watch several competitors run by and I'm like, no, I gotta, like, I'm in such good position. I'm in seventh place. Like I, this is my, essentially my debut in my mind because the Olympic trials was just a test run. And, uh, I get to my feet and I only make it another hundred meters, you know, finish line in sight. And I hit the deck again. Like I, I collapsed to the ground. Oh, hands boy. and knees and and uh anyway i get up on my feet one more time and and somehow rigor mortis my way across the finish line and collapse to the ground and uh you know i added minutes to my time my time already wasn't pretty because it was hot and humid but the place is what was really devastating to see go i faded from seventh to 13th place um and you know added minutes to my time and you know <laughs> you know i had my revenge and years later in chicago but that was definitely a rough first go at you know what what i would consider my debut so before we get to your revenge in chicago and that certainly was a terrific performance uh so that 216 where you basically were crawling to the finish line uh, at that point you were kind of zero for two if you will and so what is it that makes this marathon so darn tough and what is it that kept you going uh, after uh, 
you know, a pretty uh, uh, challenging start at the at the distance. Yeah, I think the marathon, uh, like if you if you look at the science of it, like if we nerd out about the science of it, you know, as you know, by about miles eighteen to twenty is when you hit the wall. Your your glycogen stores are in a deficit, and and you don't have the intake, the calorie intake that you need to get to those last six miles. And so I was still, or eight miles, I should say. And so I was still experimenting with fluid and hydration and, and being training my gut to get used to that. And so that's kind of something that played a big role in future marathons for sure uh, that I was able to train. But I think ultimately what kept me going at it was just honestly, the support system around me. Um, I definitely had some low moments, but you know, I, Jared Ward seeing his success in 2016 and then in future world major marathons that was pretty inspiring and then coach Istone, obviously his his debut marathons weren't great either he was you know his first two or three marathons before he made the team in 88 like he had hit the wall as well and so he was very w- well aware of my situation and is, and was pretty uh empathetic and 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 helpful in, in me navigating you know those devastating um performances um and then uh, most importantly my wife like she she from a very early stage um, in 2019, and even in my college days, as we were considering whether or not I should go pro, um, she had always been very supportive. And she'd even said, "Okay, two Olympic cycles through the 2028 LA Games. Like, I let's let's be as committed as we can to this." And so, even when those hiccups would come, it was kind of like, "Well, we're in it till 2028. Let's just pick up pick up the embers, leave the ashes, and see what we can do to to make it for the next marathon." Um, and that, that really made a big difference. Um, you know, I'd seen other spouses in the sport not be as supportive and, uh, Ashley has been supportive since they won and, and never, never regretted it. And, you know, I, I do have a mechanical engineering background. I have my master's degree. I could go make good money. And it was kind of hard to, to realize that, you know, maybe I was losing some value on the back end of my career, uh, by not starting in my mechanical engineering career now, but, Obviously, it's all paid off now, and who knows if if that degree will have something in store in the future. Well, we're glad you stuck with the running and glad you've got that mechanical engineering degree if you should ever need to fall back on it. I was going to ask you how you went from crawling in 2021 to your really impressive 208 flat last fall in Chicago. I think you pretty much just answered that. But I know there was also a surgery in there, a, a surgery that you had to have essentially a year before the trials. That that must have been frightening. How? What was it for, and how did you decide that it was better to do it than not do it? Yeah, that's, that was a, a toughy, tough part of my life, um, really trying to navigate that surgery, and as well as some other things in my life, you know. I told you about Chicago 2021 and the collapse, and then in Chicago 2022, I was also on great pace and and just got devastated the last couple of miles by Zach Panning of all people actually he's the one that broke me and uh you know he's obviously the one that ended up leading most of the trials as well and that's why he's always been on my radar but then yeah come Chicago 2023 as at, I should say right after Chicago 2022 um when I faded over those last couple of miles and, and instead of running like two hundred nine thirty, like Zach and a couple of my other competitors, I ended up running two eleven fifty one, And that was pretty hard. Cause I had some pretty big bonuses at two ten thirty, And I was like, dang it. Like I, I missed it again. And, and you know, that was the last year of my contract uh, before negotiations. And so I, I wanted more leverage going into negotiations, but I didn't have that. And I didn't know if they even wanted to re-sign me, um, but ultimately ASICS has been really great to me and believed in me for a long time. And so they actually ended up signing me. And, and But then the, the icing on the cake, or I, I guess what was the worst part of this is, yeah, right after Chicago 2022, I started having some knee pain. And I thought it was just one of those classic, like, oh yeah, run a couple of days, it'll go away, you know, do some PT and you'll be fine. But it just kept lingering and I ended up seeing doctors and physical therapists and doing some you know, homeopathic remedies and doing everything I could as, as you know, most athletes know, and those kind of injury situations. But then I ultimately, after some cortisone shots and some injections and some, uh, glucose shots, like I, it just wasn't going away. And so we started looking at surgery and, you know, the surgery was going to be really simple, but it's, you know, surgery is surgery, especially the year before an Olympic year. And, uh, and so in 20, in February of 2023 is when I decided to get surgery. And, uh, it was a pretty simple procedure. It was arthroscopy in my left knee 
they went in and they removed something called plica, which is just essentially some inflammation on the the medial uh, inside of my knee. And it was, you know, really quick, easy surgery, but, you know, surgery is surgery and it took some time to recover. And uh, so I, I took a couple weeks off and then I started biking and then slowly but surely started running again. Um, and, you know, as as most runners, like we identify, like my identity is so tied to running. And so to have, you know, not only my livelihood and my career taken away, but also like my my self-satisfaction and my like my drug essentially taken away during those months leading into surgery and after was probably the lowest part of my career for sure. Um, just mentally, almost as much physically. Um, but you know, that, that is kind of where, as I started coming back, it, it almost gave me the appreciation of savoring every run, every workout, every lift, every mile. Like it just, like I enjoyed every single point of progression and it wasn't perfect. There was actually a time four months after surgery where I, I kind of relapsed. I actually went, started having some knee pain again. And I was like, was that surgery all for not? But, uh, I just kind of doubled down and continue to do my PT and do the things I could control. And, and like I said, it, I think I was really blessed to be able to enjoy every step of the way back. And it kind of lit this fire in me heading into the Olympics. You've talked about the support you've gotten from, uh, well, from your running community there. And we had a terrific conversation with Jared Ward a few weeks ago. And we talked about the BYU marathon magic. And, and what do you think are the key ingredients to what you guys are doing there? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Because yeah, there's no denying now the magic that is here when you when you look at you know Ed I Stone, Jared, and Connor and I, and and even just others that you know are are not talked about. You you think about um, you know Connor Weaver and and just some uh, the. Jake Heslington and and just some other guys that, that are around us, BYU alum that, you know, he, Connor Weaver took 12th at trials. I think Jake Heslington took 22nd. And, and, you know, we were putting lots of guys in that field uh, in the top 20 to 30. And that was pretty cool. When I think about what really contributes to that, I think, well, you think about the mentorship that's happened. Um, you look at Coach Eyestone and, and his leading by example and, and showing us the way and, you know, the kind of training us as marathoners in the NCAA system. I kind of already touched on that, but then I think it's also kind of this eternal perspective that we have, um, that, you know, we, we just love to run and, and the eternal perspective, I guess, comes from just the faith that we share as members of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, like, uh, it kind of keeps us grounded and, um, helps us realize there's something more than just running. And that, really translates well to to marathoning just simply because it is such a grueling and long race and even training for it can be really tough. And so you just think about there's lots of ups and downs in running, but you know, the faith can keep you grounded as you're kind of going through those ups and downs. And I think that's been pretty special for me. Um, yeah. And it's just a, you know, not only do I d- identify with Jared and Connor and coach in running, but obviously I, ch- I, identify them in our lifestyles and and the choices that we've made and the faith that we share and and that it's more than just running it's a brotherhood and uh that support system makes all the difference clayton it it looked as if you had an almost perfect day at the marathon trials uh nobody knows what it's like to be inside your body going 26 miles at that pace but you sure looked like you were having fun towards the end perhaps more than connor what uh what do you think came together to give you that almost perfect day or however you might phrase it yeah yeah a lot of preparation and a a little bit of luck in short but um yeah i I just think about ultimately the just all the nitty-gritty preparation you know i i've done a lot of preparation like i said i read or i i competed in 2021 the 2020 trials and so i knew a lot what that would feel like but then I also did a lot of preparation of looking back and rewatching the 2016, the 2012, the 2008 trials, um, and then obviously picking Coach Highstone and and Jared Ward's brain. Um, I think the conditions also played in my favor. I've always been really good at running in the heat and humidity. Uh, I won the the NCAA 10K in 2019 in, in Austin, Texas, and it was really hot and humid. And and uh, and and so I've always considered myself a good heat runner since then. And I knew the preparation that it would take. 
And so I think that helped me quite a bit. And then I also, I think I was blessed to kind of have this underdog mentality. And I've talked about that before, but like, for some reason, people really weren't counting me as uh, one of their top three after Chicago, even though I'd hit the Olympic standard. You know, I, I get it. I, I did, conditions were ideal in Chicago and, and, you know, there were a lot of other guys running other races and, um, you know, the world record was set in Chicago. So why, why would my, you know, maybe my, my time had a little bit of an asterisk by it, but, um, I think, uh, because of that mentality that I had, you know, that I was just going to go out there and do the best I could and, and cover moves. Uh, I think it really played to my strengths. Uh, I was able to really be as relaxed as possible, whereas Connor kind of, kind of had all the pressure on him. And he was, you know, the guy to beat, whereas I was just one of the guys that had a good shot. Well, you can't, uh, you can't keep uh, riding on that underdog mentality <laughs> any longer. You're going to have to come up with some other motivation. You know, uh, I've heard you, you refer to yourself as a, as a running nerd. <laughs> what, do you, yeah. what do you mean by that? Oh, gosh. Yeah, I think I, I, I thought some of the things that I did were things that all runners did, but yeah, I just kind of, like I said, I've, I've gone back and done tons of film review of just all the trials just so I could know. And I even went out to the, to the Orlando course. I got to go out there three times. Um, I wasn't planning on that, but just some opportunities had come up and, and and I had, I got to go three times and, you know, I, I ran that course so many times and I would visualize it every night. And, and I even filmed part of the course. So that way I could, have that own, like my own personal point of view of what it would look like at certain parts of the race. And so those are just like some of the things. Oh, and then you talk about my water bottles. Like, uh, I could go into detail about my water bottles, but it, yeah, that just obviously very unique situation where Clayton's water bottles might not be legal come 2028 just because it was so specific. Uh, but they were, yeah, there's something that I was able to use in 2024. Clayton, I I have a specific question here because I tried to find the regulations and I couldn't. How did you know your water bottle and the cap and the metal container? How did you know that that was legal? And and for people who are not fully aware of what you did, would you better tell us what you did <laughs> yeah, first? Yeah, I can totally explain that. Uh, essentially, you know, a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months outside of the marathon, we were having these meetings. Uh, with USATF in regards to the water stations and the rules and and some things like that. And and we were essentially told we could have a bottle every four miles and it would be 12 inches tall. It could be 12 inches tall and three and three eighths inch width. And that was kind of the rules that they stipulated. But yeah, they're, they're, I was still unsure about my... So essentially what I did is I got a stainless steel container that was like 10 inches tall and three and three eighths inch width exactly. And, um, essentially what I did is I, I took my bottle, my personal fluid bottle, which was much smaller and it would hold about 250 milliliters of fluid, uh, of Martin. I, I essentially fit that inside the stainless steel bottle and then I would fill it up with water until it was right below the straw. And then I would stick my hat kind of curled up on top of the bottle so therefore, it was my hat and my personal bottle inside this stainless steel canister, essentially, that was within the dimensions that they had provided. And then I would freeze that. So I, I experimented actually several times. You know, it was 19 hours exactly between the time that I could turn in my bottles and about when I would receive my first bottle on the course. And so I practiced freezing my bottles and seeing if it would be dethawed or cooled or, um, you know, what, what would the bottle be like when I received it 19 hours later. and you know, most of the time my bottles would be thawed completely or like slightly frozen. And I would go out to the track and I'd experiment picking them up and I'd experiment popping the lid off the canister and then grabbing my hat and then grabbing my bottle and and just really practicing all those details. So that way in the race, I could be good. I could have that, uh, you know, that fluid motion because it is kind of crazy to think about, you know, me going through all these logistics of it. But, um, in short, like, did I know it was legal? Uh, You know, I knew that it was within the dimensions, but then I also, you know, asked a couple of representatives at USATF. I was like, Hey, this is what I'm going to do. Is it legal? Like, is this okay? And even, even when I was turning in my bottles, I took videos of all of my bottles just to make sure they were within dimensions that it was like, I, cause I was really worried about being disqualified. Um, because it was a very unique, you know, approach to my bottles. Um, and I didn't, you know, while it was within the dimensions was a hat within it, 
allowed. And, and the fact that I was throwing two bottles instead of one. Um, but ultimately I, I got the green light from USATF and that's why I felt like confident in, in that method I could use. But like I said, it, there's a good chance it could be disqualified by 2028. Uh, I don't know if, you know, having hundreds of athletes grab stainless steel metal canisters and throw them across the course is going to be the safest thing for a future event. But one athlete, I think we could get away with it. <laughs> well, uh, it was great at the trials, and I'm sure a few other people are going to be thinking about whether they can get away with it in, in, in Paris. But I, I want to put the ball out there even further. And, and my suggestion to you is that in Paris, you should run wearing a bro bra <laughs> that contains energy gels that you can pull out of the bra, but also frozen gel in there that'll you know keep your upper body cool. What do you think? Oh man, uh, yeah. Let's get Asics on here, and 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 they can engineer one up. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it past them to figure that out. But that's not a bad idea. Um, you know, people wear ice vests, so why not? Like, let's, let's put some gels. Let's put some ice in a vest, and as long as it's maybe a little lightweight or ones that I can maybe switch out the ice every, you know, five k or something, that'd be pretty cool. Cool story about Asics is, you know, we had these ice hats um, that we were kind of thinking of, like, okay, how can we pack ice in our hats and you know, Asics initially was like, you know, that's going to be a tall order to ask, like these custom hats. But they uh, they actually um, ended up being able to to fly over from Japan with some custom hats that they had made just for me, so I could have some ice in my hats, and that was pretty cool. So uh, I am gonna, since you're praising Asics so highly and and well deserved, I'm sure I am going to ask that finish line question again. If I were an Asics marketing executive. I'm not sure I would be thrilled that it looked like you let uh, Connor get ahead of you at the end of the marathon, which meant that the ASICS logo was not showing up in all of those great trials victory photos. Did anybody ever poke you in the side and say, hmm, we're not sure that was the the smartest move? <laughs> yeah, it, you know, how that last 100 meters played out, I think, was kind of a mystery to all of us. There was There was no planning. There was no coordination. There was no... Um, you take the win, I take the win. It was just, it just honestly happened. I was so caught up in celebrating the moment. I was so caught up in, you know, all of my visualization of how, you know, Meb Kifleski celebrated and Ryan Hall celebrated in the previous trials that it really, it honestly just happened. 30 meters to go, Connor put on a little bit of a surge and I was, I was kind of caught off guard. I was like, oh yeah, right. This is a race. This is, yeah, he's my teammate. And, you know, we, we had worked together, but like, what can I do to help him get across the finish line? And anyway, it just kind of happened. And I threw my arms out and, you know, he deserves that win just as much as I do because of all of the the help that he had given me from, you know, knee surgery all the way up through Chicago and into the trials. But yeah, in my conversation, it wasn't until maybe two or three, four hours later that I was thinking, I, and I, I was like, oh yeah, there's prize money and there's appearances or there's bonuses associated with this. And I was like, shoot, I like, I might have messed this up. Like that's a lot of money. And, <laughs> and I was like, dang it. Like, and you know, I probably had 10 to 15 minutes of this devil on my shoulder as I was like, oh gosh, I really blew it. Like I should have just won that race and I could have won it. And, and, but you know, after, you know, 10 to 15 minutes of thinking about it and and as we started to kind of see the reaction to what had happened, you know, there was so much positive media that was being put out there all across the internet. Um, and it was being, it was being shown in the light in which it was actually done. Like our intentions were pure. There was, like I said, there was no plan at all. It just happened as it was. And it really just showed how Connor and I are teammates first and foremost, and then we're competitors. And uh, I think ASICs really, was shown in a good light as well. Um, and I think they've, they've, I, I, I've never heard anything negative from them, but I think they probably initially were like, ah, oh, why did that happen? But I think they've come to terms with it. And if anything, I think it's received more publicity than they they've ever hoped, uh, even more so than maybe me winning. Um, and you know, I, you know, that's just, it's just who I am. And, uh, it just really, you know, it shows in the moment, you know, while I did have that, that little talk with the devil 50, you know, a couple hours later, uh, for 10 to 15 minutes, I think ultimately I'm really proud of the way that I acted in those last couple miles with Connor. And, and, um, it just shows volumes of just, you know, the relationship that him and I have. And I think that shines far more than maybe, a an ASICS logo across the finish line. I think I got more attention than, 
than ASICs ever imagined. Well said. Your friends in Provo organized the post-trials uh, victory celebration for you and for Connor. And I know that uh, Meb, whom we just mentioned, showed up as a surprise guest. And tell us what, what that was like and, and what did it mean to you and, and to Connor? Yeah, that was that was really special. Um, yeah, we have a good friend here. His name's Todd Garner, and he he's been a big support to all uh, distance runners here in Utah, and uh, especially us as we prepared for Chicago and for the trials. And yeah, he he planned this surprise party, and I walked in through the door, and and Meb was the one there to greet me, and it was a, an absolute surprise. Um, it helps to have people like Jared Board who have his phone number and and can make those kind of connections and. It was really special too that Jerry or uh, Meb showed up just because he wanted to be a part of it. There was nothing, there was no ask, there was nothing. He just was invited and he showed up all the way from Florida to Utah. And that's pretty special. And, uh, you know, he's played a huge role in my preparation for over the last couple of marathons. Uh, I've read his book, uh, 26 Marathons, probably a, a dozen times, uh, or I guess listen to it. I listen to it often on my runs when I'm running by myself. And, and the principles that are taught therein, both physically but more so mentally, have just made a huge uh, contribution to just my knowledge of the sport and the mentality that it takes to run a marathon. And Meb is is a big, uh, I'm a big fan of Meb for sure, and he's he's even better in person. Well, we're all big fans of Meb, and we're all now big fans of yours, Clayton. Since you are a marathon nerd, you might, you just might have been aware of a big race in Tokyo over the last weekend. And from the results of that race, it looks like it's quite honest to say that Elliot Kipchoge may be past his prime in the marathon. I'm not, I'm sure you're not going to take anything away from him. But he's not going to be the odds-on favorite in Paris. Does that change the overall race for you and Connor and everyone else in the field? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. It was shocking to see Elliot, you know, fade a little bit, finish what tenth, get feet by, beat by four of his countrymen from Kenya. Um, and yeah, it's like, will he be selected? Will he not? He's the defending champion, two-time defending champion of the Olympic marathon. Um, and so, yeah, I. I I hope he gets selected for the race. I don't know. I, I obviously want a fair selection and, and, you know, you know, Elliot did win Berlin. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of, uh, so I guess that's why we run a trials here in the United States. Right. And, um, but I think it will change the dynamic a little bit. Um, although Benson Caputo, if he's in the race, like, wow, he, he definitely showed up and, and he's going to, I don't know. I don't know. Well, how about the fact that it's summer in Paris and that throws a wrinkle in there and it's not a time trial course. I mean, it reminds me of Athens in 04 and, you know, Americans did pretty damn well in that event. You guys must be thinking optimistically uh, about Paris. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's a great point, actually. You know, we talk about Meb's book and one of the best sections is when he goes and takes silver in 2004. Right. And um yeah, that's definitely crossed through my mind a lot. Uh, you know, Connor and I are ranked in the 50s, 60s going into this race, but with it being a hot and humid and hilly course, I think it really will level the playing field and we'll have a shot at, you know, breaking into the top 20, top 10, and maybe taking a whack at a medal. I always tell people that, you know, Jared Ward, he took sixth in Rio, which is pretty incredible given what his credentials were going into that race. And, you know, it'd be awesome to be faster and beat beat sixth place, right? As a, as a friendly competition with a teammate of mine. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. I, but yeah, there's definitely in the back of my mind, I would, I'd be remiss to say if, if I didn't think that I had a, a shot at, at getting a medal and, um, especially in the conditions of Paris, that's going to be pretty cool. Um, a cool opportunity, a great opportunity. And, and we'll see if we can, uh, get the training down and the ment- the mind right to, to really seize that opportunity. So Clayton, we call this uh, running state of the sport. And mm-hmm. uh, we'd like to get your thinking on what is the state of the sport right now in 2024? And give us your sense of, you know, the good, the bad, the, the not <laughs> so good, whatever. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good question. I, I, I think the the state of the sport is getting better. I would say it's it's not great, it's not terrible by any means, but it's getting better. Um, 
there's obviously a lot of work to be done in our sport to bring it up to the level of some of the other great sports in the world. Um, and I'd love to see that happen. You know, I felt like I've been bootstrapped, uh, in terms of finances until I finally made it big in Chicago and, and here in the trials. So, um, it would be, it'd be cool to see more money in the sport, obviously, especially for the professional athletes that are really sacrificing their, their future opportunities in the careers that they've got degrees in. Um, I, when I think about like, okay, what are some of the things that, that can change about our sport? You know, I was just reading actually all of the rules about the Olympic sponsorship rule 40. And, you know, I'm, I have this great opportunity as, as the winner of the trials, as one of the United States' first Olympians, uh, to be selected and, and, you know, but I am ha- having to jump through all these hoops for the Olympic sponsors rule 40 and uh, man, it, it just is really, I think it's bringing less money into our sport than it is more money. You know, I understand that we need to protect the sponsors that are of the Olympic games, but there's gotta be a better way. Um, cause it's, it's really inhibiting the athlete's ability to, to make money in an Olympic year. And that's pretty tough to see. Uh, the other thing that I think could actually really be better, you know, there's been a lot of controversy about the trials and the Olympic trials and the money associated with the Olympic trials. And, you know, it, we luckily pulled it off in Orlando, but it wasn't without a hiccup. And I think back to, you know, why not make the Olympic trials the greatest, you know, marathon every four years in the United States? Why not make it a mass event where, you know, it's, it's like, it's like the Boston marathon, but of every four years. And, you know, there could be so many, so many more eyes and so much more involvement in the Olympic trials if it was a mass event. And I, I think that would be really cool to see come 2028. Um, and then even just like road running in general, I think is inhibited by its tie to track and field. I think that there should be a different governing body for road running um, away from track and field. And that, that might be my biggest hot take, my biggest controversy uh, that I'm going to stay on, stay on the air. But um, yeah, I just think there's, there's so much more money in road running and it's getting pushed over to track and field when if road running stood on its own, I think it would take off uh, because it is a massive event and there's just so many more opportunities um, from a sponsorship standpoint. And I think the, the track and field sponsorships are limiting the road running sponsorships. Hey, Clayton, thank you so much for standing up straight and tall and telling it like it is. There are many of us out here who agree with everything you just said. For myself, certainly, I, I've always thought uh, the governing body for road running should be a separate governing body. And also that the mass participation trials, uh, one way or another, would be a fabulous way to add to what's already an incredible event, the Olympic marathon trials. So I think, you know, our our, our favor, our, our goodbye uh, uh, favor to you is to give you three fairy godmother wishes for the rest of the year. You can wish for yourself, family, the Olympics, your teammates, uh, whatever. So what what three things would you like to see in 2024? <laughs> or yeah, beyond? Good question. I think the first the first thing I would say um I would say if I could have a a healthy Jared Ward, one that was on this Olympic team with us, that'd be wish number one. Like he has been such a big contributor to, to my success as an athlete and as a person, as a father, uh, that a healthy Jared Ward, um, that was towing the line with me at the Olympic trials that was making that team with Connor and I, that would be wish number one. I think, you know, he was very gracious, uh, at the Olympic trials and, and obviously was really excited for Connor and I's success. And, you know, that's just who he is more than he is an athlete. He's a fantastic human being in person. And, and I would have, I would have loved to him to, for him to make that team. I, and then, uh, I, I think wish number two, um, I, it, I think, you know, people might think this is interesting because he's a competitor, but I think of Kelvin Kiptum, like if we could have had Kelvin Kiptum for another decade, it would have been pretty incredible to see what he could have done. And, you know, there's a little bit of controversy about his performance in Chicago. Yes, I get that. But, you know, that's a once in a generation talent that I think we could have seen some really cool performance from him. And yeah, I'd be racing against him and I'd be seven minutes behind him in the Chicago Marathon like I was in 2023. But, you know, he was just incredible as an athlete. And I think it would be incredible to have him back and 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 racing. And then the third one, obviously, let's go get that gold medal. You know, I think... <laughs> getting a gold medal would be my third wish and, and, uh, sharing that with those around me would be pretty spectacular. Uh, I, there's no way I couldn't, couldn't wish for that. 
Clayton, thank you so much for those thoughts also, uh, and particularly for joining us today on the podcast running State of the Sport. There might have been quite a few people out there who didn't know you a month ago, but they do now, and everybody is rooting for you this summer in Paris and for the rest of your career. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. That was an insightful conversation with Clayton Young, Amby. He's come so darn far in the last 12 months. It's exciting to think about what might, what might be possible for him in the Olympic marathon this summer. What did you find most interesting about Clayton's comments to us? Well, of course, I, I really like the fact that he's a uh, self-acknowledged running nerd, which puts him in the same boat as me. I didn't know that he had a master's degree in engineering. No surprise there because he's a super smart and accomplished guy. Uh, So he's got something he can fall back on if he needs to. But right now he is really all in in his running, obviously. I like the fact that he's admitted to reading Meb's marathon book, Marathon 26, I think it's called. He's read it a dozen times. I don't know what he got the 11th and 12th time, but he's in there looking for every nugget he possibly can. Uh, And I want to note that our friend Scott Douglas wrote that book along with Meb. So Scott and Meb have both been helpful to Clayton's marathon career. I, I couldn't get enough of his discussion of those interesting metallic bottles that he used in the marathon trials. When I first learned about that, I went deep into the World Athletics website and everything else I could find looking for the regulations, and I just couldn't find them. Clayton admitted to us that he found them, and he thought he was in good territory, but he checked very thoroughly with the USATF people in Orlando to make sure he was doing something legal. Uh, It was legal. He said there probably aren't too many mass marathons with 20 or 40,000 runners who would like to see metallic bottles discarded all across the course. Uh, But in the Olympic marathon trials, it worked for him. And uh, it was quite a bit of his story there. And I decided to see if I could out-nerd him. So I suggested that in Paris, he should wear a bro bra. And in our discussion, I described a bro bra as one that contains uh, energy gels for supply during the race, but also frozen energy packs to keep the body, the upper body cool during the marathon on a hot Paris day. And he listened and he hummed a little bit and he said, "Mm, that might be a good idea. Maybe I'll look into that. So uh, if we see Clayton in a bro bra in Paris, which I am not expecting, but if we do, he's going to have to give credit to me. Uh, Well, that would be be (laughs) incredible if he runs well (laughs) with a bro bra. We'll we'll, uh, be raving about that on the podcast for a long time. I might have to get into action and and trademark one uh, pretty quickly if I can. But what did you what did you like most about uh, Clayton Young's comments? You know, Abby, we we never planned on this podcast being the BYU Runners podcast. But now in the last few months, we've had long discussions with Connor Mance, Jared Ward and now Clayton Young. And I've got to say, there's definitely something special going on in Provo, Utah. It seems to be built on success, experience, and mentorship, starting with Coach Ed Eyestone, our old friend from our Runner's World days, and extending through three decades of great marathon runners out there. The runners have a deep appreciation for each other and for everyone else, friends, wives, who contribute so much to their efforts. They built something that combines the best of team, family, and community, and it's really powerful. I also appreciated Clayton's view on sponsorship limitations for Olympic athletes. 
on the possibility of road running becoming its own governing body rather than a subset of track and field, and the idea that the Olympic marathon trials could become an open race where tens of thousands of other runners could compete at the same time as the trials qualifiers. Clayton is, you know, he's a guy who's thinking as hard and creatively as he is running. And, you know, you got to just love that, Andy. You know, Clayton's thinking, his mind, his incisiveness, his nerdiness is something that I hope will be around in our sport for a long time. So I'm wishing him a very long, successful career. And, and that's it for this week's episode of Running State of the Sport. We hope you enjoyed joining us as much as we enjoyed being here with you for this time. We'll be back again soon. Until then, please tell your friends about Running State of the Sport. We'd also appreciate a review at your favorite podcast host, like Apple Podcasts or Spotify Podcasts. In signing off, here's our hope for the state of your own personal running. Chin up, clear eyes, full heart, keep moving, onward. <laughs>